for the first of our special online American the World Flashpoints lecture series. Um, we are especially excited to do this. As you know, the world has changed in a few ways and as uh, many groups, not just our scramble to move programming online, um, we feel like it's very important to keep both our audience engaged for us to be a way where people can stay globally connected right now. And uh, also for us to act as a resource for our community and our region um, during this crisis. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Um, today's program on spreading the word, not the virus, communication in times of crisis of COVID-19 um, is very fortunate to be sponsored by Jane Kim. Right here in our region, Jane Kim was started um, as a way to design specialized custom and unique chemical products for the chemical industry. Um, what's really neat about Jane Kim is they work hard to be environmentally friendly and develop sustainable products. I want to mention that their founder, um, who happens to be Surinda Jane, um, is an amazing peace advocate, and community health advocate here in our region. And I would like to thank him today for supporting us. Um, today's featured uh, lectures are Dr. Shanice Chris and Nathan Stock. A little bit about Shanice that you may not know. First of all, amazing education background. Shanice has her doctorate from Harvard and the Chan School of Public Health. She also has a master's of public, public administration and is a presidential public service fellowship from Harvard, uh, excuse me, Harvard Kennedy School of Government. I think that gives you uh, quite a unique combination of skill set there to address this topic, Shanice. Um, Shanice also has a background with the Peace Corps, having served in South America and uh, also has held positions at ICF International and the CDC, Centers for Disease Control. So we are so glad to have Shanice with us. Moderating this talk for us is our own World Affairs Council Upstate Steering member, Nathan Stock. Uh, Nathan has a unique background as well. Nathan is a non-resident scholar with the Middle East Institute. He has a background with the Kennedy Center for Peace, which happens to be personally near and dear to me um, for their amazing work uh, on humanitarian issues in this world. Nathan has spent time living in Jerusalem, working to run the Carter Center's Israel-Palestine field office as well. Um, he's also lived in Afghanistan. And where else, Nathan? Yeah. China, China. So again, a broad global background here to be with us. Um, thank you both for joining us. Um, just for reference, everyone with this lecture series, this will not be our only one. We're hoping to have seven lectures in this series. As you can see, the phones keep ringing here at work. Um, but we hope to have seven. The next one will be April 15th next week with Dr. Brent Nelson. That's going to talk about the global economic impact of this COVID crisis. So I hope you'll tune in again next week. Um, and then the following week, we'll celebrate Earth Day. So turning it over to you, Shanice and Nathan. Thanks, Tracy. Um, before I hand the mic to Dr. Chris, uh, just a couple of procedural points. I would ask that you keep your microphones muted and your video feeds off. Uh, Dr. Chris is going to present for about 20 minutes. Uh, in the course of her presentation or afterwards, please type any questions you may have into the chat feature. Once Dr. Chris has finished, I will read aloud questions uh, for Dr. Chris's response. Uh, we are scheduled to go until one o'clock and we're crossing our fingers that our first ever uh, Zoom lecture will go off without a hitch until one. So uh, with no further ado, Dr. Chris. Thank you so much. I am so happy to be here with you all today. And of course, we're talking about very serious issues. And so now, if you could make me the host so I can share my PowerPoint, please.
You are the host. Thank you. Um, could you do it again? For some reason, it's not letting me share my screen. Okay, Shanice, just give me one second. Let me try. Okay, I had something up here that said Nathan was the host. So I don't know if he has it and can pass it on or if you still have it. Uh, yeah, I'm Yeah, for some reason I'm the host and I'm Hold having... on. It is not Nathan, you're gonna have to make her the host. For some reason it went to you with the three dots and or send it back to me. Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, sorry, okay. There. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. We're already troubleshooting, getting everything done that we need. <laughs> All right. So there's some talking boxes on the side of people's screens. And if you would like, you can go to the top left of the face feature and you can minimize it. So this is what we're talking about today. Spread the word, not the virus, communication in the time of COVID-19. And literally every day, there's something new that we can communicate about. And this communication is critical to our public health structure and system and to the safety of so many people. So I just want to do a brief timeline here. First of the US and then of South Carolina. So I just want to highlight a few things. And as you're looking at this timeline, I'd like you to think about what type of communication did we receive? You can think about what went well, what you wish would have gone better. And again, throughout the comments section, when you have questions, please pose them so we can talk about them later. So here, if you think about it, now it's April, just January, we had our first case, and February 29th was the first death in the U.S. All this is for the U.S. here. Then we talked about testing. March 15th, CDC recommends no gatherings of 50 or more people. Then Hawaii was the first state to say 14-day mandatory quarantine for visitors. Um, here, March 26, just a few days ago, the U.S. leads the world in confirmed coronavirus cases. And then March 31st, 80% of Americans are under lockdown as 35 states issue stay-at-home orders. And then April 3rd, the CDC recommends people wear cloth face coverings in public. And I have to tell you, almost every member of my family has made a cloth um, face covering. So here, just look at South Carolina. We'll look at our executive orders, what have happened, and I'll just point out a few. The first thing started on March 13th. Then we all know about school closings and it's impacted everything. Then social distancing. Then March 23rd was interesting because that's when the governor said, no gatherings greater than three people or there can be enforcement actions that are taken. Here, the 27th, self-quarantine for individuals in high-risk areas, restrictions on beaches, and then March 31st, April 3rd, closures of a lot of businesses, and then April 6th, this happened, home or work order. And later on, I'd love to talk about messaging for this, because if you've seen different things in the news, it talks about you can be at home, you can be at work but you can go out for groceries, to visit families. They even, even have something about faith communities. So there's a lot of things for, things for us to explore there. But who knew that the pandemic would lead to this? No toilet paper. And so what can we do to change the communication so that people can behave in a way that we all can benefit from things that we need? So one thing that I think that's impacting us is the anchoring effect. There's something called an anchoring bias. 
Typically, you hear about an anchoring bias when you're thinking about buying a car or negotiating a salary. But many times you can take a theory from one area and put it into a different discipline. So in this case, people tend to rely too heavily on the very first piece of information they learn. So what did we first hear about coronavirus? We heard it only affects older people. We've heard that children are not affected. We didn't hear too much about the asymptomatic or the importance of protecting other people. And so as you've had this rapid change of communication of what we need to do to keep ourselves safe, some people are still anchored with the first information that they heard. And when you're doing communication, you have to specifically unanchor that messaging. You have to say at the beginning, this is what we first heard. The information has changed. What we thought about the virus has changed and these are the updated things to consider. And so we have to explicitly say those types of things and anchor it in what's happening now. And you can still see that people are stuck with the first messaging. One of the key things is when there's a pandemic, when there's a crisis, you have to be very clear at the beginning to say, this is gonna be an evolving situation. There's gonna be new information all the time. You may have to change what you're doing as we continue to find out new information. So that's a key part to the messaging. Now, when there's a crisis, um, there's four ways people process information. And so by understanding how people take in information during the crisis state, we can better plan to communicate with them. So we'll look at these four ways. We as people simplify messages. So many times there's very complicated or complex things that people have to follow, but they just hear the simple message. So what do we need to do? We need to simplify the message from the beginning. Then people hold on to their current beliefs. And so for our current belief to change, we have to present as many credible sources as possible. And I think now in our society, we have to be very clear what credible sources are. Um, I'm very into media literacy, understanding the biases of any news source, but looking at a variety of things to get credible information. The next one, we look for additional information and opinions. So if you lead an organization business, you have to make sure you provide the people in your organization consistent messaging and multiple points of credible information. And the last thing, and we see this a lot, people believe the first message. So if you're trying to get messaging out for something, you need to make sure you release accurate messages as soon as possible. So do your homework and get it out there simply, credibly, and consistently. So this is something interesting that I saw that was on um, floating around dealing with health communication. And so we think about that being a simple message. What did we first hear? Practice social distancing. And everybody is like, what is social distancing? Some people even have said that it should have been called physical distancing because if you think about the mental health ramifications, some people are being so isolated that physical have your space apart versus social distancing so people can still connect. But here, um, they said more clear, stay at home, get groceries once per week. And so what are those clear directives that we can use? CDC now, with their updated website, again, they're always updating the information, here are the key messages that they have, and they have demonstrated in picture form. And on the website, it also, also has instructions. So we all heard about washing our hands, and you probably heard that most people wash their hands incorrectly, but 20, 20 seconds of vigorous hand washing. Then you see stay at home. They want us to stay at home. And then the second best they look at is social distancing. Then wear a cloth mask face mask in public. And the Surgeon General, you probably have seen that video show how to make that mask at home without sewing, which is very helpful for me. Then if you call for sneeze, 
cover your cough, and lastly, you talk about disinfecting. So these are simple things. And this is what's always interesting. Many times to be healthy, what we're asking people on the, on the face level seems simple. And some people may not do those things. But we also have to look at the social ramifications. Some people cannot do those things based upon their type of job, income level. And so we have to make sure we're keeping a holistic view as we're thinking about these behaviors and also making sure our messaging can support these messages and that we create an environment. So if you have a business or organization, how can you create an environment where it makes it easier for people to do these behaviors? This is from the Greenville News. They had a picture with social distancing. That was a great um, picture showing with the cart, the person, and six feet. Then we have been seeing a lot of other types of social distancing. And this actually has been very positive to see people are still keeping their spirits up. So what I wanna take a moment to do is talk about these four phases that people go through where they're dealing with crisis and emergency risk communication. There's a rhythm. And so, of course, we had our preparation phase where people were learning about it, but I would like to posit that there's different cycles based on all the information that we get and the different um, things that the government is asking us to do and public health officials are. So what I like to point out for preparation is draft and test messages. So before you send something out about whatever message it is, if it's dealing with a crisis, you need to make sure you have a team of people, small team, but a team of people that you make sure they review it to make sure you're giving the intended message and developing partnerships. And I have seen so many partnerships and I've loved that. What I'd like to point out about the initial phase is express empathy. This is a hard time. This is harder for some people than for others. And just to name that and express that and explain the risk and the actions that we need to take. What I want to point out about maintenance, and some people would say, maybe now we're in the initial moving potentially towards maintenance, constantly explaining ongoing risks, and you have different audiences. So if you think about your customers versus your employees or your board of directors, what are the different messages that those different groups need to hear? And critical, address rumors. Rumors happen so quickly. So don't just think, oh, we're not gonna, no one's gonna talk about that anymore. Just address them head on. And the last step, resolution. So discuss lessons learned. So we'll have a chance to do that today. We can talk about lessons learned that we have just up to this point and revise your plan. So if you're thinking about being the person who's gonna deliver the message, two critical components for successful communication for the speaker is credibility, speed of release and accuracy of information. So make sure you have those important sources and then trust, empathy and openness. So for instance, you've seen on the news that people are getting COVID-19 that work at different places, let's say the grocery store, fast food restaurant. What you don't wanna happen is that the news breaks that story before you send that information out to the people, your employees and your customers, because they wanna know that you are being open and not hiding anything. The last thing I'd like to cover is dealing with organizational communication. So step one, you create a team for centralized communications. You do not have to do this alone. Make sure you have a team of people. You see this a lot, even not in crisis situations. There'll be businesses or there'll be commercials and people will be like, how in the world did they release that commercial? That was so not the appropriate thing to show. So have a team. Make sure you communicate with your employees on regular intervals and then communicate with your customers regularly. And also with the customers, you need to focus on what's important to the customer, provide relief when possible. So if they can be discounts, I know it is a hard time, so it may not be able to have that option and that's fine, but there's ways that you can make it easier for the customer. 
focus on empathy rather than trying to create selling opportunities. People now can be in a fragile state. And so you don't want to make sure you're there. Um, step four, reassure your shareholders, your board of directors, different people who support you, and be proactive with communities. So thinking about how you can contribute to the community, what are partnerships, what are those ways that you can connect. So in closing, um, the, a good message to take away is that when you're doing communication, simple, credible, consistent, accurate information as soon as possible. And now I am looking forward to our discussion. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Chris. That was excellent. Uh, thank you. So uh, I would like to encourage uh, everyone <clears throat> participating in our lecture to type questions into the chat function. Uh, and I will uh, read them out as we proceed. I'm going to use my uh, moderator's prerogative to ask an opening question. Um, Dr. Chris, I thought your point about the importance of both uh, trust and credibility in messaging made a lot of sense. Um, what are the implications of the polarized uh, political environment that uh, the United States is in? Um, President Trump is a polarizing figure. Some uh, strongly support him, some strongly dislike him. Given that that's the reality, how does that impact uh, messaging from public health authorities and, and what can be done to address that? Thank you. That's a great question and something that a lot of people are thinking about. So automatically, depending on your political leaning, you're going to have a certain viewpoint. And so what we could do is have a communication team for people in leadership positions that say, we know this is your normal mode of communication, but we'd like you to try these particular things. Now, obviously people can do what they'd like to do, but I hope that regardless us being um, wise consumers of information, we can parse out the information that is credible, and that we can use, and so that when we're communicating in our organizations, we can make sure that we emphasize ourselves being credible and having empathy. And so that's what we have to do at this point. And also just point out, regardless who's the messenger, if we are the people who can make a difference where we live, how can we make sure we're the credible and um, source with empathy? Great. Um... I'm going to try to take these questions in order. Uh, the first question I see is from Kathy McAfee. Thanks very much, Kathy. Uh, she writes, can you give an example of how to unanchor a first message or first information bias? Okay, that is a great question. So let's say um, the first one is it doesn't affect young people. We remember seeing the news where there were so many people on the beaches, brain break. And so you have to speak directly to the audience that you'd like for their behavior to change. And you can say, when we first found this out, we thought it didn't impact this age group. But let me tell you something, things have changed. I need you to hear this and understand the importance of what you're doing and then go down the list. It's important because there are people now who are younger who are still having ramifications. You are going to be around other people that can have, um, that you could transmit COVID-19 to. And so you just have to say explicitly, this was the information we had at first. Now it has changed. You need to hear a new message. Thank you. Our next question comes from Tracy Fries, Upstate International's director. What communication blunders during the COVID crisis stand out to you? And what have been the successes or triumphs? I think a blunder is not having consistent messaging. So when your highest health officials, you also have the CDC, the National Institutes of Health, epidemiologists and scientists who study how diseases work, when you don't have an alignment of messaging with the government, I think that is something that has been a major concern because there'll be one information presented, one piece, and then 
there'll be another piece that kind of belittles or minimizes what the messaging is. So I think that is one of the biggest issues that we've had. Now, something that I think has been exciting, thinking about the wonders, people have been writing wonderful opinion pieces about things that we should focus on. And so I feel that the public has been rising up and saying, this is appropriate, this is not, this is what the research says. So I think it's nice to see that empowerment in that sense. And I have to say now, I've seen a different tone in some um, positions in leadership of how they're addressing it and lining up more with the scientific community. Okay. Um, this question comes from 290955. I'm not sure who that is, uh, but I, I believe the question is regarding uh, a, a set of drugs typically used to treat lupus that Ooh. some have touted as a potential uh, cure for COVID that is now in high demand. Uh, but then there in turn are accounts that the Indian government is holding back supplies of this drug that would otherwise be exported from India. Can you comment on this? What I have to say with any of these um, drugs that people are saying that could be a remedy, it is very tough. We're having a very, um, a, kind of a piece of conflict here because normally it could take months and even years to test any drug. And so it's a concern, but we're under a crisis. And so there's been a lot of different talk about different medications or drugs. And so regardless what happens, if they decide to put it on short order, or if we're able to get access, we're going to have to document everything very carefully. Because right now, with a lot of different things, it's anecdotal versus systematically tracking. And typically, if you do a research project, if you do a randomized control trial, you have two groups of people who are randomized into groups. One group gets the medicine, the other group gets the placebo or the fake medicine. And so that takes time. And so we are in a very particular situation. Mm -hmm. um, Kathy, I know you have another question, but I want to give an opportunity to someone who's not uh, spoken yet. This comes from Arliss Moore DePera. I think your, your name is cutting off in my I interface. Know her. Yeah. Uh, well, she thanks you for the presentation, Dr. Chris. Uh, she writes uh, In the Latino community, we value close contact and affection as a way to reassure the value we have for other people. Um, there's a social media campaign spreading the message, love me from afar. Um, or, uh, do you think this simple message would be effective to promote physical distancing in our community? The message, love, love me that. from afar. And I think what's important too is that we are culturally competent. And so making sure that you have people within the different communities that are connected and so I, I, I have heard that. I, I think that is a beautiful message. And it's very clear, again, social distancing versus physical distancing. So love me from afar kind of really shows that. So thank you for offering that. Great. And I, again, I'm going to keep taking people who haven't asked a question yet. And I'll, I'll come back to those who have sec repeat questions. So the next would be uh, Dr. Alex Akuli. Uh, Alex writes, um, at the onset of the situation, before it was a major crisis, uh, there were some organizational leaders hesitant to alert their constituents uh, regarding what was coming. They were, were concerns about prematurely raising anxiety. What advice would you offer in, to address this question? The, the balance between alarming people and uh, making necessary preparations. I think what you can do is offer information in small pieces because what we know today is different than what we knew a few weeks ago. So I can understand why people may not want to alarm, but it has to be messaging about behaviors that we can take now and saying we're going to closely monitor the situation. Things could change in an hour's notice. So giving information in bite-sized pieces, but also keeping the last part saying, this could change and we will make sure that we update you. And I think that's the way. This is what's going on globally. We have a few cases here, but in other countries, the spread has been quite large and we wanna make sure that we do our best as a company to protect you. And so this is what we're doing now and stay 
tune. And I think that would be a good way to do it. Great. Um, Karen Center writes, leadership is clearly very important in communicating and trusted leadership even more so. Um, how does the role of the media come into play here, especially now that our media is arguably politically biased? How do we unpoliticize this pandemic? Wow. Well, the first thing, and we saw this happen a few weeks ago, the World Health Organization, they said explicitly they want to call this coronavirus or COVID-19. They made the conscious decision to make sure they go to the virus name and not put it with a place. Even though there have been other pandemics that have been associated or called by a place space, I thought it was very interesting that the World Health Organization did that. So again, aligning ourselves with the scientific community and how they are presenting information, everything is so intentional. So when it comes to the media, I noticed, depending on the news show, they were using different terms for it. Maybe there have to be common agreements that we will, well, the media will agree to. Although we know that people, we have liberty and people can decide what they like to do. But I also saw, again, from the public, when people on Twitter, you saw on different social media, they took people to task saying, we really want you to call it COVID-19 or coronavirus. And after that happened, we also saw government leaders changing what they were calling it. So many times it's the people who have to take the media and other leaders to task. Great. Uh, Kathy McAfee writes, how should we humanize the mounting death toll uh, to get people to take it more seriously? Um, for example, in the ways that we honored the victims of 9-11, uh, she writes, I feel we're numb to the loss of life uh, due to COVID-19. I think that's a really interesting question. And when I watch the news, I should say like the major channels, the major news channels, it seems like they're really working on humanizing what's going on. But not everybody watches that. Or people say, that's happening in New York. Now we've seen uptick in Detroit. California, that's not happening here. But what I have seen are more personal stories of people being impacted here in South Carolina, here in the upstate. And so people have to just continue to share their story. And unfortunately, some people will not be impacted by other people's stories, but we can have a series where we do that, where people focus on that on the local level, social media, and just telling stories, maybe it's video stories, maybe it's links that we have, but it takes everybody's part. And I have to say, I've definitely seen an uptick of personal stories of people that I know that have had a death from COVID-19. And I think with our social networks, that will continue to grow. And I think people will continue to be taking it seriously. And individually, I have to make sure that I do my part and take care of doing what the regulations are, and make sure I communicate that to other people and, and, and explain the seriousness of it individually and also thinking about large areas. Great. Uh, 290955, I think that's Rob Rowan, uh, writes, um, there are some religious groups that have tended to ignore public health guidelines around COVID or have gone so far as to hold religious services or funerals. How do we reach communities of that nature um, to impact the spread of the virus? I find this very interesting because even when I read the South Carolina executive order yesterday, I saw that um, religious institutions were allowed to meet even though they highly say that they shouldn't. And so I thought that was striking about the executive order. Yes, we have seen a lot of these institutions, maybe what we really need to do, this could be interesting, is get everybody in the congregation tested. Of course, we have a limit of test kits, but for those mega churches, the ones that have thousands of people, the ones that are getting all the media attention, it could be impactful to test people there to see the percentage and explain to them the spread and then the depth that could come from that. Sometimes people don't look at information from afar. It has to be them. 
we can continuously give them the scientific information and I'm sure that they have that. And so they might be having to frame the message in the terms of that specific religion and doing some messaging from that point as well. Okay. Um, Arles writes, uh, she believes that the, the media and the public health system is not sufficiently emphasizing the message to take care of oneself so as to care for your loved ones, so as to reduce the risk of spreading the disease to others who might be more vulnerable, even if you happen to be younger and at lower risk. Um, is this, a, do you agree that this is a message that should be conveyed more frequently, um, particularly because youth might believe it's okay to incur higher risks for themselves because they have heard this message, this anchoring message that they're at lower risk for serious complications. Um, when I hear that, it makes me think about when you're on an airplane and how you get to put your own mask on before you help somebody else. And so I kind of like this messaging. You have to make sure that you take care of yourself so you can help other people stay healthy and additionally not harm them. And so I think that messaging has come out some. I think it could come out more. But what I think would be helpful is seg segmenting the communication. So we know it's a certain age group that needs this messaging. We should focus on the media that they're paying attention to, maybe the social media, the shows. I think it would be interesting too to offer more commercials on streaming services that deal with this issue. And that might be happening. And so I think we just have to segment the messaging for the particular population. Great. Uh Kathy McAfee writes, um, should our leaders who are communicating important messages also model behavior? For example, wearing face masks and practicing social distancing? In a short answer, yes, they really should. Um, something that I thought was quite interesting, in our culture, we do the handshake. Although that is a definitely a easy way to spread germs because then a lot of times people will touch their face, nose, eye, mouth. And so I, what I really would have loved to have seen is that somebody from a top leadership position presented a different way to greet each other during this crisis. Something that maybe could have become a social norm. So instead of saying we have to stick with our social norms, say, okay, during this particular season of life, this pandemic, we're going to change things. And we want you to change things in this way. And this is how we would greet each other. This is how we would use face masks. This is how we would practice social distancing. Some people have been doing that well. Some people have not. But I do think um, there's a lot of behavioral theory that you have to model the behavior. So if you have somebody modeling the behavior, and especially to someone that people look up to, they'll feel more comfortable doing that versus someone saying, I'm not gonna do that. They're suggesting that, I'm not doing that. And so I agree with that point wholeheartedly. Um, Tracy Fries writes, the reality in the US is that people are divided along political lines and that includes the information sources that we consume. Are the right-wing versus left-wing media bubbles fueling inconsistent messaging? How can we get the public to turn toward academics or other independent experts who don't have a political agenda? Yeah, that is the age-old question we've had for the last several years because we've become so polarized in everything. I think it has to be potentially an independent media campaign. And so an independent media campaign that buys airtime on the news station. Hmm. Or if there's a group, a, a collaboration, a collective of people in the scientific community that intentionally has a public relations person who's trying to be the guest on these different shows. It has to be intentional. There's another thing that we can consider. I know there's media organizations. So maybe they draw up different lines of guidelines for everybody to consider during this pandemic. And if there's a statement from a larger organization of guidelines people would use, that could be another additional idea that they would say, 
when we're talking about COVID-19, these are the things we're focused on. And when we have our opinion part, let's say those are our opinions and separate them from the facts. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from Begona Caballero Garcia. Um, can you comment on how Black and other minoritized communities are being affected and dying from this pandemic uh, at alarming rates due to inequities? Right. Uh, there's been a lot of information out there. And so when you look at the different news articles and you see the inequities, especially in, in some of the places, the percentage of people with COVID-19 among the Black community or African-American community is higher than the percentage that, of Black people that live in that area. So some of the things people can sit, and, and this is something I like to say an unanchored too, because I remember when COVID-19 first came out, I saw things floating out there on the internet saying that Black people had immunity to COVID-19. So that is an unanchoring point. Now, when we go back to that, we think about different types of jobs where people are living. And so some people have jobs where they still are required to go into work. And so you may see a prevalence of that. Also, we know there's a stigma in the healthcare system dealing with certain populations. There's a lot of research about that. And so I wonder about the role of stigma or bias that could be happening. And so I'm actually happy to see that there's a lot of news, um, there's a lot of news channels covering this issue. So we can look at each individual point and try to counter, um, do a counterpoint and try to do interventions to help with that. Okay. Um... Uh, there's been a couple of comments in the chat function on uh, religious leaders from different communities who have told their congregants or their followers that in some way or another uh, they're exempted from this virus or that the virus is man-made but they're protected by God. I'm, I'm summarizing a few people's points. Um, and in response to that, there's a question. Um, Dr. Chris, have you seen uh, research regarding communication of, um, uh, of punishments or disincentives that can lead to modifying this kind of behavior. Like penalties, like monetary penalties, that type of thing? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, as I understand uh, the governor's order from yesterday, you could conceivably incur a misdemeanor offense. Right punishable by a fine. Um, are, are those kinds of, of criminal sanctions, do they tend to be effective, particularly with communities that, sub-communities that might be particularly resistant to these kind of public health guidelines? I would definitely have to look more into research. <clears throat> In general though, um, sometimes people don't take part of a certain behavior unless there is a consequence. So that's some just general public health policies. Although I love to see public health policies where people take advantage of it because the environment makes it easy to do so. And so with the case with different religious organizations, I will have to think about that some more and do some more research about it because I can see it going, I can see how it could go either way. If people are penalized for going to different faith organizations, they can have a rhetoric dealing with persecution and what we're doing. And, and so that could even cause more people to get involved. And so you have to be very careful. And one thing in public health that I always think about, the unintended consequences. So sometimes you would try something on a smaller scale before you implement it on a larger scale. So maybe you wanna try a city before a state or before the country and to see how that would work. Because many times people have good ideas but in practice, those unintended consequences can cause even worse health outcomes at times. Well, on that note, Dr. Chris, could you comment a little more broadly on the governor's order from yesterday? You mentioned that there are several exemptions in his stay-at-home order, exemptions for work and, and religious gatherings. Are you confident that the order as structured will be effective? Should it go further? Well, I think that every leader has to make the best decision as possible with their, um, their, their staff, their constituents, and of course, 
it's a difficult issue because we have the public health side of it. And if it was just public health alone, you would have everybody be separate for two weeks and we would see a huge flattening of the curve. But the other half is economics. And a big part of public health is the social determinants of health, which looks at income, it looks at neighborhood, it looks at access to resources. And so when you have people not being able to work, that's gonna cause a huge strain on everyone. So actually it is a very difficult situation that anybody in leadership has to make. But if we look at that specific order, Again, I'm thinking about consistent messaging. It said, stay at home or stay at work, which was, I thought, hmm. And then grocery stores. So I'm interested in what are essential versus non-essential businesses. And if we, if you're going out and just riding around in your car, social distancing out and back home, you'll see people that are out a lot of different places. And it's kind of surprising. So going back to the grocery store, on the national level, I heard that they want people to not go to the grocery store this week. I don't know if that was conveyed so much on the state level or not. So how do we align national with state? And we have differences across state, and you also have to take into account the number of people who are diagnosed with COVID-19, but that also means there's a lot more who are not diagnosed. So whenever you have testing, that is, a portion of the true amount. Mm -hmm. And can you quickly summarize on that last point, Dr. Chris, the best estimates available now as to uh, what our number of positive tests indicates about wider untested rates of infection or, or people who may be asymptomatic. Can you just quickly summarize for our participants our best estimate as to how big the outbreak actually is now as opposed to our test results. So if you're looking at a lot of the different research, there's various models that people are using to try to indicate how many people are infected. Um, when we first learned about it, we saw that if somebody had COVID-19, they can affect up to 2.5 people in normal circumstances, and then you see that spread over and over. Now it's going to be interesting to try to detect what the model would be. There are different numbers that we've heard for South Carolina of what it would be positive test. But again, the model is an estimation, it's a guideline, but the key message is there are more people with COVID-19 that are, that we know then that are tested. So there are more people and you do not know who has it because you can be asymptomatic and it can impact people in different ways. Great. Um, Tracy Fries writes, can you comment further on marginalized and other at-risk communities, particularly the impact of the virus on the middle class uh, versus the poor, and what are the communication impacts and implications of this? I think this has been very interesting because somebody's middle class, upper class, and you have a job where you can work at home, so you can work at home, you can continue to get paid. Basic things like internet, like we have now, although in South Carolina, I know for students, they're having spots where people can get the internet, but it may not be available to everyone. Not only the internet, not everybody has a computer, an iPad. Even when I think about, I have a six-year-old daughter, we're doing, like most people, have the students at home, home you're doing, your work. And even though that has some stress, it's not the same as someone who is dealing with these issues that have more financial constraints. And so I do think the messaging should be different. One thing that I just saw is on local levels, so I'm, I'm on city council and travel stress, and so we just had a page that we have all these connections of the organizations that can help people who may need help during this time, and ways that people can contribute. So really, out of pandemics and out of crises, the things that always come up that are heartwarming are people helping each other. So we really need to get out more messaging of how we can, the people who have something to help and how to get people connected to those 
resources. And I think that will be a critical piece because you do have government interventions, but you also have private citizens who can make a difference. And so I know a lot of people are thinking about that. Uh, Kathy McAfee writes, um, how should uh, organizational leaders, business leaders, be communicating with employees who may have been laid off or furloughed? Uh, she says, I'm afraid they're ignoring them and, and only focus on remaining staff, and this seems short-sighted. You do have to communicate with everybody. Again, the two groups are not going to have the same types of communication. So you have some that are the same, you will have some that are different. And so, again, always with empathy and openness, that's kind of like the foundation of what you're going to talk about. But you should give people updates on information that can impact employees. And then you might have, I would say you should have different messaging. Maybe there's online classes, free online classes that people who are not working right now can take. Showing that we're, we have these resources and we're so sorry, we're not taking this lightly. I don't think anybody who has laid off anybody is taking it lightly, but to, to continue giving information. I'm not going to say it's going to make it easier for somebody who's in that situation, but you can have some messaging for them. Well, I believe that is all of our questions. We have about uh, eight more minutes. Does anyone want to type in a last question or two for Dr. Chris? And while y'all are doing this, I really appreciate your questions. This has been a great conversation, and I'm glad that we were able to try this over Zoom and have a really productive conversation. Uh, well, let me just see if there are any last interventions. I don't. Oh. <laughs> Uh, tell us about the beautiful painting behind you. Last question. Okay, I love that because this is a good question because we're connecting as people on the individual level. So this is a painting, it's trees, and I love trees because I think it represents growth. And so I like to have that everywhere. And also representing that we need to go out and walk among the trees, have fresh air and be healthy. And so that's a little bit about this painting. And that's my first professional painting that I bought. Well, thank you. That is a lovely note to end on, Dr. Chris. We really appreciate your time and all the information you've shared with us. Thank you so much, and I'm glad that we had this conversation today. Be well, everybody. Thanks.